All right, let's get started. So, of course, you guys have to put up with my tourist pictures, and so you can't go to Paris without seeing the Eiffel Tower. So you always have to see the, you know, the Eiffel Tower from, from there, and here's a close-up. Now, what's cool, I'll show you later on, um, they put lights on this for the, for the millennium. And so on the hour, starting, I don't know, at night at night till, till midnight, um, it's lighted up and then the lights go crazy. And so lights go crazy for about three minutes on there. So we'll show you that later on in the, uh, you know, in the lecture series. That's your incentive to you know, come in so that you could see them. And so during the day, it's just kind of a big metal tower, but it's pretty cool at night. And this is looking, this is from the Arc de Triomphe. This is now looking down at Champs-Élysées. And this is, Brad, what's that? Oh, man. Um, I don't know. I thought you were just there. I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was conf Oh, it's the palace. That, there's, no, that, there's the Louvre. Oh. That, there's that Louvre museum, you know, yeah. that, that's got all them paintings in it. I didn't, where's the pyramid? I don't see the pyramid. It's just past the oh, arch. Okay. Right, right back there. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going to go there in a minute, so. Okay. And this is just looking in the other direction. And so we just kind of got a 360 panorama looking around the, the Arc de Triomphe. All right, so today we're going to talk about the conjunctiva. So let's change the order here because you guys, you know, you guys are getting too comfortable. Teresa, tell us about the three main parts of the conjunctiva. Three main parts. So there's the bulbar and the palpebra. All right, here's the bulbar, conjunctiva, uh, right here. Here's the palpebral. What's the third part? Is it the fornicile? The fornicile, all right. So when we look at it, the conjunctiva, what we really think about as conjunctiva is, is the bulbar conjunctiva, the conjunctiva that's sitting on the surface of the sclera adjacent to the cornea. But remember now, it, it goes into the fornicile conjunctiva, and then reflects back, and remember the conjunctiva from last week was the innermost layer of the eyelid. And so you've got the palpebral conjunctiva. So three main parts of conjunctiva. So when we looked at the lid last time, remember the conjunctiva that's the palpebral that's lying the inside surface of the lid is really tightly adherent to the tarsus and the posterior part of the lid, whereas the bulbar conjunctiva, and especially the fornicial conjunctiva, is very, very loose. There's this loose connective tissue underneath it. You know, let's go back one layer here, okay? Let's talk a little bit more about the conjunctiva. Uh, Brad, tell me about the epithelium of the conjunctiva. So it's a stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. Okay. What are these little dots in here? Those are goblet cells. They're goblet cells. And if you look, you can see that the further away you get from the limbus, limbus is up here, the more goblet cells you have. So you don't have many goblet cells here in the limbus, but as you get down into the fornix especially, you have lots and lots of, of goblet cells. Mike, what do goblet cells make? They make mucin. Mucin, and why is mucin important? Uh, it coats the innermost layer of the tear film. Okay, so while we're at it, we might as well just throw it in here. How many layers are there of the tear film? Layers. Three layers. So this is the innermost layer, the mucin layer. What are the other two layers? You got aqueous, which is the kind of middle of the sandwich, and then oils on the outside. Okay. So, um, Rachel, what um, what are the cells that make the um, surface layer? Exactly. So remember, we looked at the meibomian glands, the oil glands. They make the surface layer. What does that do? Exactly. So it kind of coats the surface of the tears. It keeps them from evaporating. So even though you make aqueous tears, sometimes if you have meibomian gland disease, they will evaporate rapidly and you'll still get, get a lot of dry eye symptoms. The mucin layer, which is made by the goblet cells, is important because it makes the surface of the eye wettable. So it, it kind of covers the little microvilli on top of the conjunctiva and the cornea, makes it wettable. Catherine, what are we looking at right here? Uh, so this is an external photo of the left eye. And it looks like there's a, um, kind of white area 
white kind of fatty elevation at the lotus basically? It's a kind of a white, really elevated. It really doesn't look like a, you know, what you'd see with the pterygium or pinguecula. I'll give you a hint. This is a child. Well, not necessarily lipo. It doesn't have lipo in it, but dermal. dermal it's, it's a dermal, um, it's a chorostoma. Now, they used to call these limbal dermoids, and the term dermoid is tossed around so much, it really confuses people. And so, I really like to use the term dermoid for the, the congenital cyst in the orbit. And so, this is what we call a, a lipodermoid, but the proper name for it is a limbal dermal chorostoma. What does chorostoma mean? So, uh, chorostoma is when there is a proliferation of benign tissue that is not usually at that anatomical site. Okay. Marshall, what does hamartoma mean? Good evening, by the way. No, benign tissue that is not, that is in the right place. Exactly. Exactly. So that's a good way to, to, to keep them apart to remember. Hamartoma is a benign growth of tissue that normally is there. Whereas chorostoma is a growth of tissue that's normally not supposed to be there, although they are benign. And so when we look at a limbal dermal chorostoma, Chris, what is this thing right here? That This is actually from that child. Uh, so it looks like almost like a hair follicle. You see like the sebaceous glands, it looks like a little hair follicle. Right? Exactly. So you normally shouldn't have hair follicles and sebaceous glands at the limbus. So thus the term Chorostoma. So you've got a little sebaceous gland, you've got these hairs, you've got this dense connective tissue, but you can even have other stuff in these. Uh, Ariana, what is this thing? Is there any question? Oh. Uh, it's like a cartilage. Cartilage, exactly. So let's go to a higher power. So what's interesting is these limbal dermal chorostomas can have cartilage in them. It can even have this stuff in them. Sneha, what is this stuff? Glands. Glands. What kind of glands? Uh, eccrine glands. So you can even get eccrine glands, like like lacrimal glands in there. So you can get lacrimal gland. You can get cartilage. You can get hair. You can get fat. You can get all kinds of of things in these chorostomas. What systemic disease do you get concerned about in a child who's got a limbal dermal chorostoma? Sean? Uh, golden hars. Golden hars. So what else do kids with golden hars have? Uh, pre their skin tags. Exactly. So you look in front of the ear, skin tags, and they have funny teeth and bony abnormalities, all kinds of things. But the key is, is you may see a picture on boards of a limbal dermal chorostoma, and then they'll show you picture of an ear tag or something, and so you need to know that that's associated with Golden Heart Syndrome. There's the cartilage. So very interesting stuff. Allie, what is this thing? Um, Sorry, it's overexposed picture. I took that myself. That shows how. External photo. I'm not sure which eye. It looks kind of like or elevated white plaque with some vessels over Could that be? Pinguecula, exactly. So if you guys look carefully, virtually every person in Utah over the age of 15 has a pinguecula. I mean, it's just automatic. That's part of my normal, you know, um, um, smart phrases is pinguecula. Every person has it. it diagnosis one, pinguecula. Diagnosis two, dry eyes. And so those are the two things that occurs in everybody in Utah. Why do you think we have lots of pinguecula in Utah? What part of the sun? UV. UV, exactly. So this is ultraviolet exposure. Because we're at altitude, we have lots of UV. But secondly, what do people do a lot of in Utah? They do outdoorsy things. They ski, <coughs> hike, climb, all kinds of things outdoors. And we get 300 days of sunshine a year, as opposed to the Midwest, which gets you know 30. And so we get 300 days of sunshine. And so, Everybody in Utah has a pinguecula. It's very, very common. All right, Teresa, what is this now? The pterygium. Pterygium, what's the difference? So it's grown past the limbus onto the cornea. 
Exactly. So a, a piguecula and pterygium are really the same pathologic features. They're, a, you know, UV-induced degeneration, but a pterygium grows <coughs> over the limbus onto the cornea. So what do we find pathologically when we, when we look at these? Uh, last wave degeneration. All right. So here we have, this is the substantia propria underneath the conjunctival epithelium. You see this little squiggly characteristics here. And so it's as if someone has taken the collagen, you bombard them with UV, they almost look like frayed rubber bands. And so you get this solar elastosis coming here. What else do you get in these? Uh, basophilic degeneration. Basophilic degeneration, this smudgy blue-gray, again, UV-induced degeneration. What the heck is this stuff? So it looks like calcium. Calcium. So you can actually get calcium in these. And so when you look at pterygia with your slit lamp, you can actually see little white specks sometimes of calcium in there too. So that's just a sign of longevity. Uh, Mike, is the epithelium in a pterygium thick or thin? Thin. Thin. And how, how is that helpful? Um, if you're looking for a malignancy, you expect something to be more thick, whereas pterygium is more kind of thinned out and Exactly. So a pterygium, the disease is under the epithelium. It's in the substantia propria. Whereas in a, you know, disease affecting the epithelium, you know, a tumor, a CIN, something like that, you would see thickening of the epithelium. And you can actually tell that on a slit lamp. So if you're looking at a lesion of the slit lamp, you can actually see <coughs> thickened epithelium when you're looking there. So that's important when you're trying to differentiate lesions. All right, boy. Keep going around. What the heck is this thing? It looks like it's this uh, like translucent appearance of the uh, yellowish, um, almost transluminated. Yeah, if you put a little fen off head on there, you'd see that that would transluminate. So we look at it, and what? This is the lining of that lesion. What are we seeing for the lining here? So what is that lining made of? What's that epithelium? No, I wouldn't buy that as cuboidal. I would say that's more stratified squamous looking. What is this thing? Yeah, so there's goblet cells in here, and there's a stratified squamous epithelium. So what do we call this lesion, this cyst? People call this an epithelial inclusion cyst. And so there's been something happened to put a little bit of epithelium underneath the substantia propria, and then what happens is then it starts to grow and it'll form a cyst. So either a trauma, a previous surgery, something like that. So they call these epithelial inclusion cysts. All right, we'll just keep going around the table there, Catherine. What is this we're looking at? Um, so we're looking at mostly the palpebral conjunctiva, and it looks like there are follicles. All right, so there's a bunch of these guys down here. These are follicles. And when we look at a follicle pathologically, what do we see? Exactly, and, and you see it almost looks like you're looking at a lymph node. You know, you see this cluster in the center here of these lighter staining lymphocytes and then surrounding by some darker staining lymphocytes. So it almost looks like a lymphoid follicle. So that's how you remember that follicles. So follicles have these gathering of lymphocytes. Now, if, if there are vessels, the vessels are around the periphery of the follicle. So the center of the follicle doesn't have a vessel in it. It's got just these gathering of lymphocytes, almost like a lymphoid follicle. Uh, Marshall, what are entities that give you follicles? Um, viral and uh, allergic conjunctivitis. All right, so viral conjunctivitis is one that you commonly see. So when you're looking for signs of, say, an adenovirus conjunctivitis, you want to 
pull that lower lid down with the cotton tip, not with your fingers. Don't get those viruses on your fingers. And you look for these, but also um, these are really indicative of, a, of an allergic reaction. You'll see tons of follicles that are down there. Here's a close-up. You've got these lymphocytes, paler staining in the center, darker staining around them in a follicle. What the heck are these, um, Chris? Uh, excuse me, Ray. These look more like papillae to me. Okay, so how are papillae different than follicles? Well, they have a central vessel, and you can see that in the bumps. There's yeah, if you look at each one of these little bumps, there's a little vessel right in the center of it. And so um, what papillae have is they have this little central vessel popping up and then the thick epithelium around them. So those are the difference between follicles and papillae. What's a, um, Ariana, what's a common entity that, that causes papillae? Contact lenses. Contact lenses do. And what, what condition do they cause? Indeed. So you have someone who comes in and they've got a you know, real irritation in their contact lens will flip that upper lid and you look, you'll see all these cobblestones on the inside surface of papillary conjunctiva of the upper lid. And this is called giant papillary conjunctivitis because they really do look like giant papillae, if you will. And you can see the vessels in the center. They're very vascularized in the center of each one of these papillae right here. So remember the difference, follicles, papillae. Sneha, what are we seeing right here? Where are we looking here now? Um, so seeing some raised lesions along the lens. Okay. What could give you... All right, I've got to give you a little history. 14-year-old, male. Uh, itchy, itchy, itchy eyes. Exactly. So people will call, you can have a vernal conjunctivitis, vernal meaning spring, from what language? Now, from the Latin. <laughs> to sneak one in there that's not, so vernal from the Latin. But again, you remember the Greeks invented everything. The Romans, they, they took from the Greeks and, and took it there. So this is from the Latin, actually. So vernal meaning springtime, and so you'll often get especially in, in, in adolescent males, you get this really itchy, itchy springtime allergy, and you'll look at the limbus and you'll get these bumps right here at the limbus, and so they call this limbal vernal. So vernal conjunctivitis, it can give you these limbal bumps, and they really are follicles. So these little, uh, these, I'm sorry, papillae. I said that wrong, they're papillae. So you get these little papillae at the limbus. All right, Sean. What are we looking at here? Um, so there's a large um, kind of pedunculated lesion on the uh, lower um, palpebral conjunctiva. Here's the path. So there's lots of loose connective tissue, um, lots of vessels in there. Okay, so this is a classic pyogenic granuloma. Why is this one of those terms we have to memorize? Uh, because it's not pyogenic or granuloma. Exactly, it's a double misnomer. Pyogenic means literally fever-inducing, so it's not infectious. And granuloma means giant cells and epithelioid cells. So this is called a pyogenic granuloma, and it's been called that for years in, you know, in the literature, but it's not pyogenic, nor is it a granuloma, so it's a double misnomer. So it is what kind of tissue? Granulation. Granulation, so kind of like exuberant scarring tissue. Think of this as like a keloid only of the, of the conjunctiva. So loose connective tissue, multiple blood vessels coursing through it, lots of edema, mixed inflammatory cells, lymphocytes, plasma cells, PMNs. And so this is usually a reaction to something. So something get in the eye, maybe they had a surgery, maybe they had something fall in the eye and they get this exuberant granulation tissue. So, pyogenic granuloma. All right, Allie, what are we looking at here? Looks like kind of diffusely injected vulvar conch with some chemosis. Yeah, not only in 
injected, but really kind of elevated, almost solid looking. I mean, you look at that, it's not really cystic, it's almost solid looking. What could give you that in the conjunctiva? Exactly, true dreams don't look like that. Um, I mean, if it was like covering most of the clock hours, you could think about a conjunctivitis, but usually you wouldn't see that much elevation. Yeah, and you don't see any discharge coming out of this. It's really pretty solid lesion sitting there. What do you make of the color there? It's pretty red. Yeah, pinkish red. Right? And so I don't know why people often call these salmon patches, and I don't know, salmon is pink, I guess. That's how they get that. So if you have this thick kind of salmon patch on here, here's the pathology. This is like a sheet of lymphocytes. A sheet of lymphocytes. So don't forget, you can get conj lymphomas. Not as common as orbital lymphomas, but, but you can get conj lymphomas, both extending from the orbit, but also individually. And so they call them salmon patches. And so you'll get this thick, elevated, kind of pinkish red you know, lesion on the conjunctiva underneath the epithelium. And so these are all lymphocytes. So don't forget, you can get lymphoma of the conjunctiva. And this is an immunoperoxidase stain showing these are mostly B lymphocytes. And so when you see these, these lesions, both in the orbit and the conjunctiva, they're mostly B lymphocytes. What are we looking at right here? We'll just start over again. Yeah. Um, so like there's this raised kind of gelatinous appearing um, whitish like lesion coming from the conjunctiva growing onto the cornea and it has increased vascularity and it's raised and elevated. What would you be worried about here? This way cell carcinoma. Okay. So if you look, you look at that, it's gelatinous. And so that epithelium, instead of being thin like you see in a pterygium, it's thickened, it's gelatinous. And so this has epithelial disease rather than um, substantial propria subepithelial disease. And here's another one. These lesions will often start at the limbus. That's the most common place. And they can grow onto the cornea or they can even grow back away from the limbus. But usually they'll start at the limbus. Now we're looking at the pathology here at low power. Um, first of all, what is this stuff right here? Uh, it looks like keratin. It's keratin, exactly. So what does that look like when you look with the slit lamp? Uh, just rougher. Exactly, and it'll often look white. And so the name people use is leukoplakia, literally white plaque. And so sometimes when you get this epithelial disease here of the conjunctiva, you will see keratin on it, and then it'll look kind of dusky. It won't have that shiny mucous membrane appearance to it, it'll have a dusky appearance to it, and the keratin will often look white. Brad, what do we make of the thickness of that epithelium? It's fairly thick. Yeah, it's very thick. Uh, yes? In the keratinized area, what are all those blue cells? Are they lymphocytes in the middle, or like what is that? No, these are actually epithelial cells that have become keratinized. So these are actually epithelial cells that have keratin um, stuffing their stuffing their cytoplasm. It almost starts to look like the um, cartilage much earlier. Well, it kind of does because it stains with that really, really intense pink eosinophilic staining. But if you look closer, I'll see if I've got a close up here. Structurally, it's not similar, right? It's just no, it's not similar. Staining, similar. It's just staining. Yep, staining just looks that way. All right, we're looking here at the lesion. What do we see in here? We've still got you there, Brad. Um, so we are seeing fairly atypical looking cells. And um, it doesn't quite look like the basement membrane has been violated yet. All right, so let's say that the basement membrane in this lesion is completely intact. What do we call this? CIN. And what does that stand for? Um, conjunct conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia. Exactly. Well, someone might say conjunctival. <laughs> what did I say? Conjunctival. Conjunctival. Yeah. Conjunctival <laughs> intraepithelial <laughs> neoplasm, so CIN. Yeah. And Mike, how do we grade CIN? So you can grade it uh, with mild or moderate or severe. Yeah. 
Yeah. Where are the demarcation lines for that? It's like in thirds, so one third, two third, and then all the way. All right, so if it's the if the atypical changes are in the lower third, we see, say, CIN with mild dysplasia. If it goes up to two thirds, CIN with moderate dysplasia. If it goes above two thirds, then it's CIN with marked dysplasia. But by definition, CIN has an intact epithelial basement membrane. And here we can see this is full thickness. Look at these nucleoli. Look at the pleomorphism. Some big, some small, nucleoli, clumped chromatin, loss of normal maturation all the way to the surface. So CIN with marked dysplasia. What do we see in here? We'll just keep going, Rachel. Almost, almost more like the last uh, image you did was plaque-like Yeah, this shows the plaque-like leukoplakia better because you can kind of see that plaque-like look on there. Now we're looking at the pathology here. How is this pathology different than the previous one? Right here, look at these cells right here. These are definitely below the basement membrane. So this is no longer a CIN, this is now squamous cell. So this is now a superficially invasive squamous cell carcinoma of the conjunctiva. And we look at another one. Catherine, what is this stuff right here? Exactly. So just like squamous cells of the skin, when you get invasive squamous cell of the conjunctiva, you can get these keratin pearls associated with it. So you get these round clusters of keratin. These cells are actually in the substantia propria. And so growing through the basement membrane into the substantia propria, so an invasive squamous cell carcinoma. <coughs> And here's a close-up, keratin, whorl, keratin pearl, but here you have keratin inside the cells, even right here. Very, very dysplastic cells, very, you know, aggressive-looking tumor at this point. Okay, what's happening here, Marshall? This down here is sclera. And so this squamous cell carcinoma is invaded through the conjunctiva. It's actually through the episclera into the superficial sclera. So this is a superficially invasive, this is more than superficially invasive, this is a deeply invasive squamous cell carcinoma. It's gone all the way down onto the episclera and even the sclera around the globe. So at this point, very difficult to remove this by just removing the lesion. You sometimes have to consider removing an eye, even removing an entire orbit. Now, when these tumors spread, Chris, how do they spread? What are they known for, for when they spread from the eye? spread along the nerves. Exactly, so here's a nerve in the orbit, and here's tumor cells along the nerve and even some inside the nerve. And so you want to really look carefully with these because if they start invading into the orbit, they can even start going back along the nerves. And so you really want to be careful with these. You want to check these people for, you know, anesthetic areas. You know, that'll let you look, you know, know where to look. And so you want to do an MRI scan. You want to make sure that this is not tracking along those nerves so this can actually leave the orbit tracking along the nerves and, and invade even into the brain at this point. And here you see again these cells around that nerve. So these squamous cells for some reason 
love to, you know, escape along the nerves. And so you want to keep that in mind when you're working these patients up. All right, what are we seeing right here? Ariana. this? Yeah, so then this is, uh, it looks kind of purplish here, but some kind of pigmented patch. Yeah, if you look right there, that doesn't look like the superficial um, pigmented conjunctiva. This is kind of racial pigmentation here at the limbus, and then a little bit of pigmentation in the conjunctiva. That's kind of almost a blue, bluish gray look to that. Where would that pigment be located? Probably uh, deeper, like junctional, like your junctional nevi can look blue, um, or this could be a mascara. Yeah, this is even deeper than the conjunctiva. This is deeper like in the sclera or even deep to the sclera. This is a picture that I really like because this is a patient with oculocutaneous melan melanosis. And this is a disease entity where you have pigmentation deep. And so this is now deep to the sclera right here. This is not conjunctiva. And so this is actually the lesion right here. This is just superficial pigmentation. And so in oculocutaneous melanosis, you actually get deeper pigmentation. And that's a really important discerning point. These patients are susceptible for malignant melanoma, not of the conj, but of the choroid. And so that's what you need to remember with these oculocutaneous melanosis people. So this is that superficial conjunctival pigmentation. This is deeper, deeper pigmentation. All right, what are we seeing right here? Sneha. Um, so here I'm looking at a more raised, um, yellowish lesion on the vulvar conj. Okay. Well, I apologize for the color. In, in clinic, that was almost more pinkish than it was yellowish. This is a 14-year-old. All right, so you'd be concerned about a nevus here. And does this help you any? A lot of cysts. A lot of cysts. What does that mean in this lesion? All right, so as we go to a higher power, what you see is you see these cysts, and what are these cysts lying by? Uh, stratified squamous. And then what are these guys in here? Goblet cells. Goblet cells. So if we go back, when you have these nevi in the conjunctiva in an adolescent or a child going into puberty eventually, they will often grow, and the tip-off is you'll see cysts in there. And you can see these with the slit lamp. And, and the way I remember it is, where do the melanocytes come from embryologically? The neural crest. So the melanocytes migrate out from the neural crest. They go to the junction of the epithelium between the epithelium and the substantial propria. Then they start to grow, and then they drop down into the subepithelial tissue. And while they're going, they grab epithelial cells and yank them down with them. Is that what happens? No, but don't say that on oral boards, but that's how you remember it. So remember, they migrate out, they grab epithelial cells, and so that lets you know this is a long-standing nevus, maybe even congenital. And so when you really question the parents, they will often say, you know, something's been there for a while, but it's getting bigger, or it's getting darker. So as these kids hit adolescence, these not only grow, there's some kind of a hormonal influence to them, but they actually get darker. And so then they notice them, and that's when we end up, up removing them. And so if you look, these will have cysts in them, and that's a really reassuring feature that this is not something that you worry about, you know, forming a malignancy. All right, so when we look at nevi of the con, Sean, how do we subdivide them? So uh, based on location of the melanocytes. Okay. 
And what is this particular line? This one is uh, junctional. Junctional. So you look at the nest of melanocytes. They're here in the junction between the epithelium and the substantial property. There's often some inflammatory cells underlying them. So this is what we call a junctional nevus. Allie, what kind of nevus is this? I'd say it's compound. Compound. So it's got both junctional and subepithelial. And then lastly, subepithelial. Sub so this is the equivalent of a dermal nevus of the skin. Again, there's no dermis on conjunctiva, and nor on the eyelid skin for that matter. But so it's kind of the equivalent of a dermal nevus. Reason that this is important is when the melanocytes lose touch with the junction, they lose their malignant potential. And so you can still technically have a malignant melanoma arising from either a junctional or a compound nevus, not from a subepithelial nevus. So for some reason, once they've matured and dropped down, they've really lost their malignant potential. What do we see in here? <clears throat> so an external photograph looks like this uh, brown kind of like dust-like lesion along the limbus. Okay. Um, so more likely a, a PAM. What does PAM stand for? Primary acquired melanosis. Exactly. So if you look at this, it's flat. It's almost like someone took pigment and just dusted it. It's often at the limbus. So this is my favorite story. I tell this every year. This is about a 40-ish year old a female um, on the um, anxiety scale of 0 to 10, about a 12, and, and just looked it up online and is asking me questions. Oh my God, am I going to die? Is this a tumor? Is it a melanoma? And asking me other questions. So 40 minutes later, I calmed her down. I said, we're going to photograph this. We're going to bring you back in six months. However, if it changes between now and then, you let me know and I'll see you sooner. And if it's really bothering you, we'll remove it. And so I'm sitting home at night, that night, you know, watching the news, and I get a call from the resident on call. Did you see patient so and so today? I said, Well, yeah, I did. Well, she just called in. It's growing. <laughs> and so she literally called that night, it's growing. And so to keep from getting phone calls every day for the next six months, I said, fine, come in and we'll remove it for you. And the reason that that was good is because we rarely see these lesions pathologically because we never remove them. And so, uh, Mike, how do we subdivide PAM? So you got with, atypia, without. Right? So what is this one? This one just looks like it's lining up along the basement membrane. It's a pretty a not atypical. So exactly. So PAM without atypia is benign melanocytes right along the basal or layer of the epithelium. And this is even what normal racial pigment looks like. So when you see a darker skinned person, it's not uncommon, especially at the limbus, that you'll see a little PAM-like looking stuff. So don't worry if you see someone who's, who's darker or pigmented, they'll have this at the, at the limbus often. And so we even call that just benign racial pigmentation. It's the same thing as PAM without atypia. And here you can see on a close-up, these melanocytes benign along the basal layer. They do not extend up into the epithelium. They don't show any atypical features. All right, what are we looking at right here, Rich? This is the part where you showed about changes in squash areas on the microscopic Yeah, so you look right now, it's kind of elevated. It's irregular. It's splotchy. It's in multiple areas. And we go ahead and we do a biopsy. What do we see in here? Yeah, let's pretend for, for this picture that the basement membrane is intact. Let's just pretend, okay? So this would now become PAM with atypia. Why is PAM with atypia important? Exactly. So, so PAM without atypia does not become melanoma. PAM with atypia does. So if you take 100 conjunctival melanomas and you look and try to see where they came from, 
probably 80% of them will arise from pre-existing PAM with atypia. Now, it's not the flip. It's not that 80% of PAM with atypia goes to melanoma, not necessarily, but you have melanoma, about 80% of them arise from pre-existing PAM. Maybe 10 to 15% arise from pre-existing nevi that went bad, and the others, sometimes we just don't find it. But by far and away, the most common is um, that melanomas arise from pre-existing PAM with atypia. So, pearl here. I shouldn't be giving you away these pearls. So, you only have to remember three percentages for your career to answer questions. 15, 45, and 80. Okay, why are those important? Because if you think something is not that common, you say 15. That way you're covered anywhere from, gosh, 5 to 25. If you say 45, then that's you're kind of covered in the middle. If you say 50, they know you're guessing. So if an attending says, well, what's the percentage of this? Oh, 50%. They know you're guessing. And so, but if you say 15, 45, or 80, then, um, you know, if you think it's rare or intermediate or, or common, then if you have no clue what it is, that's what you say, and you say it with confidence, 80%. And they say, oh, okay, yeah, very good, very good. So you get credit for that, okay? <laughs> that's only if you have no clue. Okay, so these are, <laughs> these are pearls now. I just remember these, and so I shouldn't be giving you these pearls. All right, so now we've got something a little bit worse here. Catherine, why is this worse? Yeah, so you still see the um, more superficial pigment, but you also see this scarring into the palpebral conjunctiva, like a semaphoroid almost. There's also some um, pigment down in the fornices. All right, so one thing you've got to remember, pigment in the fornix is melanoma until proven otherwise. So you can't just say, well, that's probably just PAM. No, nope. that's melanoma until you prove to me that it's not. And you can tell that this patient's had previous surgeries before to remove pigmented lesions, because look at the symblepharon, the scarring between the bulbar conjunctiva and the palpebral conjunctiva across the fornix. So this patient has had multiple pigmented lesions. They've been removing them. They keep coming back. Now, unfortunately, they've got this pigmented lesion in the fornix, and that is very poor prognostic feature. So now we're looking at this, and I want you to, this is low power, so it's kind of hard to tell low power, but if you look right here, here are some melanocytes in the epithelium, in the epithelium, in the epithelium, oops, they've now invaded. So this is superficially invasive malignant melanoma. Question? Do you see it in the superior fornix and inferior fornix both? You can see either one, yep, either one. There's no predilection. I mean, it's uncommon for it to go into the fornix. Most commonly, this will occur on the actual bulbar conjunctiva, but you can get it to spread anywhere. So right here, this is primary acquired melanosis with atypia giving rise to malignant melanoma of the conjunctiva. And as we go to a high power, these melanoma cells can look very bizarre. So if you look right here, big nucleus clumped chromatin all over, big cell, big cell, small cell, so pleomorphic, you know, many different sizes, many different shapes. And so this is malignant melanoma. And again, these can be bad actors because they can go into the orbit, it can even metastasize. And this is just a special stain for melanocytes. So you can do a stain that's called HMB45, you can do a melan A stain, all kinds of stains. Unfortunately, the stains that stain from melanocytes don't tell you benign from malignant. They just tell you melanocyte from other nasty looking cell. So we'll sometimes do these if we have a, you know, kind of a big malignant looking cell, sometimes they all look alike. And so we do these stains to tell for sure it's a melanocyte. And this is what can happen if you don't take care of these. And so this was a PAM and this was an old, you know, vet, you know, old vets, they don't come into the hospital until the eye is literally coming out of their head. And so by now, you know, this is, this is an exoneration. So you don't want to let it get to this point. And we say goodbye to the Eiffel Tower. All right, so you guys get a Christmas vacation here. We're obviously not going to lecture Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve. So have a good holiday, and we will be back. January 7th. I think.
seen a, have we seen like salmon patch on a test? Are you more likely to think like lymphoma or like amyloid? Um, lymphoma. Amyloid is much, much less common. So if you see a salmon patch, you think lymphoma. Other questions? We still got a couple minutes. Any pigmented lesion in the fornix, you have to at least biopsy it. <coughs> and Boopy will go flat out. He'll say it's melanoma until proven otherwise. He says you just remove it, period. The problem with these PAMs with atypia is like that one picture we showed. They don't show up in one place. It's like there's five different places they'll be there. And then you take a picture, one will flare and you remove it, and then another will flare and you remove it. And the problem is, is you're constantly putting out fires with these guys, but you can't just, you know, eviscerate everybody, I mean, um, exonerate everybody that's got this PAM, and so you just try to treat it as you can. Initially, some of the PAMs are now responding to topical antimetabolites, and so people are looking at those to, to treat PAM, or you can treat them, you know, by just removing them serial times. But in any event, if you see pigment going into the fornix, you really got to be careful with that. Other questions? All right, have good holidays.